Hey guys, and welcome to Modeling Mentor. Today we are talking airbrushes. Maybe you've never had an airbrush before and you're looking to find out what is the best type of airbrush for me. Maybe you're looking to find out how to properly care for an airbrush, or maybe you're looking for hacks on how to clean out an airbrush, keep it from clogging, or what to do in case you do get a clogged airbrush. Well, this is the right place for you. Let's get started. All right, guys, so first off, let's go over the different types of airbrushes that you could possibly buy. So first off, let's start off with the double action airbrush, which is the most commonly known airbrush. Now, this airbrush is when the trigger is pushed down, the air passes through the airbrush, and when you pull the trigger back, paint begins to flow out of the airbrush. So this is the most widely used airbrush among professional users. The more you pull the trigger, the more paint is delivered. And this allows a lot of control for the amount of paint that's coming out of the airbrush. Um, the flow of paint can be adjusted even while painting. Now, the next one that I wanna show you is called a single action airbrush. This is also an Iwata, Iwata airbrush. And this airbrush feels very similar to an aerosol can. So the trigger in the single action airbrush controls the airflow. When you push the trigger down, air passes through the airbrush and atomizes the paint. When you release the trigger, the airflow stops. The paint volume is controlled by adjusting the depth by which the needle travels to the nozzle. So basically on the back of this brush, that screw adjusts how much uh, paint is gonna come out and you just control the airflow. This is really good for general modeling practices, I believe. Um, I'm actually kind of interested in possibly getting something like this or maybe the one that I'm gonna show you afterwards. Cause it is really nice to be able to say, okay, well, I'm gonna be covering a large surface area like a large plane or a large tank or you know any situation where you're going to be doing a lot of one color and you're trying to cover a large surface area or maybe you even want control where you're doing very very tiny things and you want to control that needle all the way down and not have to worry about adjusting it well this is a really good airbrush for that situation finally the other airbrush that we are going to talk about is the trigger airbrush this is what's called an automatic or double dependent airbrush. This type uses specific trigger designs so that it does not require a user to push it down for air. The paint flow still is still controlled by pulling the trigger backward, same as the double action airbrush, basically just pulling the trigger just like a gun, but the airflow will start automatically when the trigger is pulled back. So this is kind of a hybrid between a double action and a single action. So it gives you a lot of control. You can start off with a very, very tiny flow in the airbrush and then the more that you pull the trigger back and the more you back up the bigger that flow is going to get so basically let's go over these one more time you've got your double action airbrush which is the most widely used airbrush this is the workhorse and the iowata eclipse i believe is probably the best value when it comes to buying a double action airbrush but this one you have to control so you push the trigger down and you pull the trigger back when you push it down, you get air. When you pull it back, you get paint. So you've got to feather that to get your control. Next up, the simplest design is going to be the single action airbrush where you only control the airflow and the needle on the back or the dial on the back controls the paint. So you can change it on the fly, but most of the time you set it to what you want and then you leave it there, do a bunch of painting, change it, do a bunch of painting. So you have a lot of control but you can't change it on the fly as quickly. And then the third one is the hybrid between the two, which is the automatic airbrush. And this comes for the most part in a trigger gun design. So it's much more ergonomic and you pull the trigger and it's first going to put out air and then you're going to feel tension and then it starts to put out paint. And right at that edge is a very fine line. And the more you pull it back, the bigger that line is going to get. So those are three different types of airbrushes that you could possibly buy. Now let's go over um, what kind of paint I use and what kind of paint you could possibly use before we talk about my airbrushes and compressors and things like that. So the different paint that I use is called regular old model color. This is the model color that everybody uses for brush painting. This particular brand is Vallejo, but there's AK Interactive, there's MIG paint, there is Scale 75, there is Reaper paint. So there are a variety of different pigment heavy, very pigment heavy paints that 
uh, I use when I'm doing a lot of my models and I started using for brush work, for paintbrush work. These need to be thinned in a slightly different way, but I like it because they're inexpensive, they're water-based, and if you know how to thin them, they're gonna work out just fine. Now also, in the AK Interactive side, we can switch over to a lacquer-based paint, which is metallic. These extreme metal paints are probably the most amazing metal paints I have ever used. Think of them as Alcad paints, which is another big brand of metal paint, but actually easier to process. But this is a lacquer-based paint. So if you're gonna use lacquer-based paints, then you have to use a lacquer-based thinner, which is gonna be completely different than our last paint, which is enamel-based paints, regular thinner-based paints. So lacquer and enamel are very easy to put through the airbrush. They have very, very fine pigments, and you can thin them down to a very, very thin, translucent color without the pigment breaking up. So that's the main benefit, I think, to those types of paints. And I don't use the colored variety, the enamel paints, very often. And I think I should in a, for a few different circumstances. But the trick to enamel and lacquer paints is you've got to obviously have lacquer and enamel thinner to be able to clean your airbrush, to mix the paints, all that good stuff. Then you also have to wear a mask. You've got to have some sort of way to get the fumes out of your room or out of your garage or out of your house, wherever you're painting, because it can get really, really smelly and those fumes are not good for you. So there's a couple of different complications that come along with the benefit of being able to thin these paints down very, very, very thin. So my personal recommendation is if you're just starting out and you're trying to figure out how to thin some paints, then maybe get a couple of bottles of the enamel if you have a well-ventilated space and you can learn really, really quickly using the enamel paints because they're easier to use. But then based upon budget concerns, it's easier to locally source through your own game store or your own hobby store the acrylic paints. So use this video and the video that's going to come after it. Learn how to mix the acrylic paints the proper way. You can still get transparent layers. You can get all the different layers that you want, all the same colors that you want but it's so much cleaner, you don't have to worry about fumes and smells and nastiness getting into your lungs, and you also don't have to worry about having to keep all this thinner around and the proper way of cleaning and all that good stuff. So next, real quick, if you've got an airbrush, you also need a compressor. Now compressors come in very wide varieties from the Home Depot or regular um, general hardware store variety, where you can get large tanks and lots and lots of pressure, all the way down to small, compact, airbrush-style compressors. This is the compressor that I use. It's a master airbrush um, compressor called the T40, or 40T. And it's got a small tank, so it doesn't turn on all the time. So you get a little bit of break for the sound. It's not super loud, and it's very easy to control. And the price is right. This one sits at $119, which is a really good price for a airbrush compressor with a tank. And I recommend something like this, especially when you're first starting out. And even if you're trying to go professional and you're trying to do this all the time, you could possibly spend 300 or more dollars on a compressor. And depending on what you're gonna be using it for, it's easier just to use this. I haven't mind, had mine go out and I've had mine for over a year now. So if it does go out, then I just buy another one for $100 and I'm still less than you would spend on a very expensive compressor. So that is my recommendation for airbrush compressors. And I think the main thing is just to remember that you want something that has a little bit of a tank to it. Oilless is also really nice that you don't have to worry about putting oil in there. I don't know if they still carry oil ones for airbrush compressors, but like very old, old ones will be an oil based and you've got to continue to put oil in there to keep everything lubed up. So we'll go over all of this stuff at the end just to make sure that you guys have a list of things to research. But let's actually look at airbrushes that I own and how to take them apart and clean them and figure out exactly what's going to be right for you. So over here at the workbench, I've got two different airbrushes. First off, these are cleaning brushes and you'll definitely want to make sure that you get something like this. It's just a wire brush, but you use these all the time for cleaning that airbrush. Very, very important. So my very first airbrush was the Pache VL double action airbrush. So it still has the push down 
and pullback motion. And this airbrush was very inexpensive. I think I bought this one used and it had to have been less than 40 bucks used. I think new, if I'm looking at them right now, you can get an entire kit which comes with different needles, a hose, cups, everything basically the starter kit for $73. So this would be a very decent, but also comes with its own problems, airbrush. I would not go any cheaper than this to be honest with you though. There are Chinese knockoffs and there are very, very cheap airbrushes that are made with very, very cheap parts. And I, in my personal opinion, you're gonna run into different issues if you go with a cheap version and you're gonna end up struggling, we'll say, okay? So this is my very first airbrush and it really did work just fine. Basically you change out the tips whenever you want to go to a different size needle. You can adjust everything from the back. You can pull the needle out if you want to. This is a larger needle. So I'm using this for large surface, surface areas. And I also use this for my metal paints. I have not in the past had a couple of airbrushes to be able to separate metal from regular painting. And that's another thing to consider when maybe you're, a, you're already an airbrusher and you're looking to get a second airbrush or replace your airbrush. Keep the old one and use this for metal because it's harder to clean metal paints out of the airbrush. That's just another tip, another hack for you, is that when you airbrush with metals, you have a lot of metallic pigment that gets stuck in here. Now this is gravity fed from underneath, or siphon fed actually, from underneath. So the force of the air actually pulls paint up into the brush. This makes it a little bit harder to clean because all you, know, you have is this little hole here to be able to clean out the inside. So one of the things you have to pay attention to is if you've got paint up in there, you don't want to pull the needle out and then tilt your airbrush back and have that needle flow or you have your paint flow backwards. Just some little tips there. But this one comes with, you can get a variety of different cups there and you can even get this huge siphon cup, which can sit on the bottom just like this, which I've really never used. Haven't had a need to paint that much. But this is a, a very good workhorse. And now the airbrush that I use most of the time now is a Harder and Steinbeck double action airbrush. This is the Evolution, okay? It also is the double action, very, very smooth trigger response. It comes, it's a two in one. So it comes with a 0.3 and a point or a 0.2 and a 0.4 needle. So real quick, let's just go over needle sizes. So the bigger the needle, the bigger the spray, right? Because when you open the hole, you have a much larger surface that's coming off. So for model paints like the Vallejo and the Reaper, the bottled paints like this, these are very pigment heavy paints. And even when you thin them down, there's still a lot of pigment in there. So the perfect size is 0 0.3, 0 0.35 to be able to get these things going. And you can still get a pretty small detail out of that 0.3 or 0.35. 0 0.2, I have to thin them very carefully and you can still get it to go through. So, I mean, I'm not having a lot of issues, but I wouldn't really go below 0.2. Once you go below 0.2, you're really looking at thinned, very nicely thinned enamel paints or ink. Now, as far as use goes, this one is a great brush. The only thing that sucks about it, and I made a hack for this, is the tip. So look at these two tips. You'll see that they are just a little bit different. And the reason why they're different is because I actually dremeled the tip cover off of the one that I'm using and I will eventually dremel this one off when I'm ready to go back down to the point two. The reason why I do that is because paint collects in this tip. You can even see that there's white in there still and it happens really, really fast. And as soon as you get paint going in there, it's like making a zebra stripe or a cheetah stripe on an animal. Like it just starts dripping and everything's going all crazy and it's really, really annoying. And the only reason that the tip is there is to protect you from touching the needle. So if you're careful, then I recommend cutting it off. On other airbrushes, like for example, this one, you can see that it's got an indentation. A lot of them have a magnetized tip that'll go over it. And if it's closed off like this, this is actually really, really useful. When you're mixing your paint, you can put your finger over the hole, as long as it's big enough to where you're not stabbing yourself, and backflow air into your cup and it will mix your paint for you. And that's a really, really cool hack 
that I can't do on this one. I just have to do it the old school way. But it's really nice to have. I still love the flow of air from this one. And this is a more expensive airbrush. And more expensive than the one that I'm actually going to recommend to you, the Iwata. So the Evolution 2-in-1 is a $206 airbrush and it comes with that extra needle which helps cover the cost. But the Iwata is only $140 and I would say that you're going to get the same quality out of it as you would for this. Now I can't say anything about the quality of let's say like the metal, the workings here, like how long the pieces will last. Maybe the German company does a little bit better but honestly from all the stuff that I've read the Iowata Eclipse is probably one of the best model making airbrushes that are out there. Very, very good airbrush. But anyway, I digress. So this one has adjustable cups, and so does the Iowata Eclipse. It looks exactly like this. So you can put a small cup on, you can put a large cup on. I always use a large cup, even if I'm only putting a small amount of paint in there, because it's easier to mix. So I always keep the back off the airbrush. The reason why I do that is, for hack number one, if you start feeling like paint is starting to dry here on the tip and you know that you're starting to get a little bit of sputtering, the outside's clean, you're wondering what's going on, it's really really easy if the back's off to just unscrew, pull this out, clear it, just give it a good squirt, psh, psh, put the needle back in, don't push it too far. You want it to be snug but you don't want to actually bend the brass that makes the tip and then just tighten it up. And that will help clear a lot of the clogs that you have just by loosening up the paint that's starting to dry around the needle. So I leave it open. And it doesn't change the feeling or dexterity of the actual airbrush itself, okay? So as far as cleaning goes, when you're done for the day, when you're not changing paint colors, because you don't really have to do this when you're changing paint colors, though if you get into a good habit, it's, it's nice. When you're done for the day, you pull your needle out and you wipe it down. There's always going to be some kind of paint residue on your needle, so wipe it down. Then all you've got to do is make sure that this is all wiped down, and then you're going to grab a spray bottle of ammonia-free regular old cleaner, okay? So this is a hydrogen peroxide multi-purpose cleaner. Green stuff works awesome, but you just need a regular multi-purpose cleaner. No ammonia, okay? Ammonia has the potential to damage the metal of the airbrush. So unless you know exactly what metal the airbrush is made out of, it's just recommended not to do that. But all you gotta do is just give it a couple of squirts, squirt, 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 you fill it up. This fluid really breaks up paint. And then you just run it through the airbrush. And you do that a couple of times, then you start rinsing it with water. I have a water bottle that has a little neck on it, so it's easy to put water into the airbrush. Then you just rinse it out. And if you're gonna be doing an, a full cleaning, then it's time to take the parts apart, okay? And you just unscrew everything. And then you go in here and you scrub away, right? So you get inside, Scrub the little pieces, get inside the neck here, scrub everything out. And then once you're done scrubbing everything out, be sure to go back, run it with water, to get any type of little deposits that you picked up out of there, okay? Then you put your front assembly back together, which for this, this is separated into two pieces. You got your tip, and then this is the actual needle tip that matches the... Uh, the needle itself. So this is different for every size needle because it's got a different hole. So that fits right back in here. It's going to be similar for the Eclipse, but the Eclipse might be a little bit easier to work with where it's not built in like this. I prefer multiple parts because I wouldn't have had to cut this thing off if there were multiple parts in the front. Then you grab, I've got mine in just this little jar, you can buy airbrush oil. Airbrush oil is the best for keeping parts clean. Keeping everything well lubricated. Grab a throwaway airbrush, or a paintbrush, and we'll just start at the front, even though I've already taken this tip off. Let's go in here, run a little bead. 
close it up, run a little bead back here. We're going to take this piece off, run a little bead back here, and basically we're just going to lubricate all of our screws. Then, get some oil on your needle. This will prevent it from sticking and it also increases the flow for a little while. Keeps that paint from drying out. So it can prevent clogs for a little bit. Then we go in here, oil this up. Check your O-rings is another good thing to do like once a month just to make sure that you've got no leaks. And now your airbrush is back together. And that's for a good high quality one. You don't have to worry about getting in here. Now again, if you pull that needle out and you tilted it back with paint in there, that paint's gonna start flowing back here. You've gotta take all of this apart and do what we just did to clean it out. Remove the needle, remove the trigger, remove anything inside the trigger like the springs, you know, all of that stuff. So it's not recommended. If it does happen, it's definitely not the end of the world, but that could be what's causing you issues. So if you cannot get an airbrush to work, pull everything out of the back and look in there and see if there's anything clogging anything up, okay? So once this is done, you're ready to plug into your compressor. And I've got a quick connect, which is super, super handy. You can buy one for less than $10 on Amazon. That's just an easy way. This one has a little regulator on it so I can open and close it. Absolutely love having a quick connect so that you can change your airbrushes in a fly. And that's really about it. So just to recap, let's go over a couple of the things that we went over at the very beginning. So you've got three different types of airbrushes. You've got your single action airbrush, which means you push down and you're just talking about the flow of air. And on the back, you've got a dial that controls the amount of paint that comes out. And you set that dial and then you can just paint with whatever size you want. If it's gonna be really, really super small, or maybe it's really, really big. It's just single action, so you're just controlling the flow of air. Then you've got a double action, which is what we had before. That's gonna be this guy right here, where you push down and you've got airflow, you pull back, you get paint, and you can control both. So if you just barely push down and barely pull back, then you're gonna get just a little tiny flow. So it's a little bit harder to master, but you can do everything with it. Then you've got the hybrid, which is the trigger type gun, and you're gonna pull the trigger back and it's gonna start the air and then it's gonna feel some pressure and then it's gonna start paint and it does everything automatically. So the more you pull back, the more paint and air comes out at the same time. And that one's a good hybrid. But if you're just starting out, I recommend getting either the Pache um, SL, yes, VL. Get the Pache VL if you don't have a whole lot of money and look for one used because you can always clean these out. Like this is just a cast piece of material with a dial on it. You can clean these and make them work again. This would be a great first option. Otherwise, it is much better to not spend 70 bucks on this, just wait until you have the money and get the Eclipse. This is the one that you could use for years and years and years and years and years. 140 bucks, and it's worth every penny. So you got your airbrush, then you need your compressor, and then from there, you just have to decide what kind of paint you wanna use. Do you wanna use acrylic? Do you have a lot of acrylic? Do you already have a lot of enamel paints that you've been doing, using for your brush? Then choose whichever one is gonna be best for you. And we're gonna go over what it's like to paint with acrylics mostly on the next video. That's gonna be Airbrushing 102, where we show you how to mix paints, how to spray different types of patterns, how to stipple, all the different techniques for air pressure and things like that. So that'll be the next video. And I hope you guys really enjoyed learning about the different types of airbrushes how to clean your airbrush, how to protect your airbrush from clogs, and if you do get it clogged, how to really get in there and clean it out and lubricate it. If you like these videos, please subscribe. It would be awesome to be able to show you guys more. We go live on Modeler Mentor Mondays through Wednesdays right now, so please check us out. We've got some great projects coming up, and have a great day.